Well, welcome, everybody. Uh, thanks for taking an hour out of your day here to join me. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, Business Intelligence Management Data Mart, uh, kind of why we need one, what does it do, and how can we use this to manage our stuff. So uh, just a little bit about me. Uh, we'll get that out of the way early. The slideshow today is really short. I promise we will bore you guys with the slides. Uh, so I'm a senior consultant at Pragmatic Works. You can find me presenting at SQL Saturdays, Code Camps, and SQL chapters around the country. I blog at a site called intelligentsql.wordpress.com, and you can find me on Twitter. My handle is at SQLBISchmidt. Uh, so the Business Intelligence Management Data Martin, why do we need this? So what is this, and why do we even need to create it? So if your manager came to you today and asked you how, if you were meeting your nighttime SLA, could it, do you know what that answer is? So they said that there was a company standard and said, all of our processes should run in less than 20 minutes for all of our SSIS packages to complete. And every query out there should take less than 15 seconds to run. And every report shouldn't take more than 10 seconds to render to a user. These are all really important questions that as BI people, we really need to be able to answer these immediately. And we need to have the tools out there. And there's a lot of third party tools out there. So you can go out there, you can buy software that does it. There's Idera, there's Pragmatic here, there's all these different tools, but there's not that many that centralize everything. You, there's a lot of tools out there that are just SQL Server monitors, uh, or they just monitor SSIS, or just monitor SSAS, but there's not that many that kind of wraps everything all together. And so our challenge is, how do we, how do we report off of all these different pieces so we can get all this information together? Uh, so when we're talking about SSIS performance, what are some of the things that we want to know? So how many packages failed? What's the average length of time my packages are taking to run? And of those packages, what components or executables are taking the longest to run? And if you've worked with frameworks at SSIS, so I'm assuming with this presentation that we've, we've created the SSIS framework and we have a framework in place of some sort, whether it be BI Express, whether it be a uh, homegrown one, whether it be a CodePlex project, whatever it is, that we've got some kind of framework in place around our SSIS SSIS packages so that we can see, so that if errors are happening, they're being logged to a location. We're logging the performance information. We're logging that warning information. And we'll step through one real quick here so we can see what it looks like. I'm just going to use the BI Express one that was created uh, just because that's what I have on my machine. But really, any kind of homegrown framework that you've got will work just fine. And in 2012, with SQL Server, we got this really cool new tool called SSISDB. And it was all about SSIS and we're changing everything over to the project deployment mode where we're working with things with logical units of work and how does so how does that kind of change the game so to speak so we've got all this new information that we can track through the SSIS DB and anything that runs in project mode on that server gets logged into that SSIS DB so we can see what the performance is And that's really all I got for you. I promised you guys, I told you it wasn't going to be a very long slide for the presentation. Uh, I really want to spend some time kind of diving into to what we need to do. So the other big kind of challenge of, of having a centralized management data mart is getting solution, getting buy-in from the business of so this is actually something we even need to create, right? So if we say, I need to spend two weeks and build myself a a management kind of centralized repository where I can track SSIS packages from, it's, well, this business need is more important. So we don't have time to go do that right now. So the great thing about this is it's very easy to set up. It's quick. It's dirty. It gives us what we need. And when we're done, as we'll see, we'll have this really nice dashboard that shows the SSIS, SSAS, and SSRS performance. And we can expand and kind of do this all at once. Uh, so I'm going to start. And first, we're going to talk about uh, let's talk about our our event handlers first. So I'm just going to open up a package. Let's open up the right solution here too. So I'm just going to use a solution that we use uh, pretty commonly here at Pragmatic Works, which is uh, about some insurance data. And in it, we just we can see we're moving some data. We're doing a a load of a dimension, and then in our event handlers over here. We've got our we've got our on errors, on warnings, and our on pre and post execute, and these are our event handlers, right? It doesn't if you have one on your local environment, it doesn't have to look like this. It's just whatever does the job for you. So we can see every time there's an error that happens, it gets logged off to this database or it gets logged off to this location. In this case, it's getting logged into the BI Express database. 
And if we expand the tables up here, we can see we have, a, here's our SSIS kind of execution logs. So here's our data flow. Here is our, there's our data flow. Uh, we've got our package variables, and here's our task execution log too. So we can see here's the different things and how those things are executing. So if we expand one of them, we get all this information inside of it. And this is just happens to be what we're tracking, but typically you'd have a package name, right, and then you'd have your execution start date and your execution end date, and then how many errors that you had or, or what that error was. So what are my warnings? What what caused this package to fail? What are these different pieces of this framework? And if you guys have any questions as we're going through, feel free to ask them. I'll try to keep an eye on the little box, so if I see a question pop up, I'll try to answer it as we're going. Uh, that way we don't have to kind of backtrack when we're done. Uh, but uh, we're tracking all this information through our event handler. We're tracking errors. We're tracking warnings. We're tracking all these different pieces of runtime. And they're being logged into usually pretty dirty tables like this, right? So we've got our package name, our data flow name, our execution start, and our execution end. But it's very, very normalized or very denormalized, rather. So we've got our, our sources and our, all of our stuff in one. We can't really look at it from a reporting perspective. It's very, very difficult. And I see a question pop up, so hang on just one second. All right, well, I don't think we're going to need to answer that one. So I'm just going to keep on skipping through. Uh, so we've got our, our source name, and we've got our execution start date and time. How do we track all these pieces through, and what, do we look, uh, what are we looking for tracking all these pieces? And as we go through our package, so every time it runs, it's logging this information. Regardless of whether there's any errors or not, it's logging at least the performance information. It's one of the great things about our framework, as we can see, how is my package moving over time? So if we think about kind of SSIS packages structurally, uh, so what are some things about SSIS packages that we really want to know if we really wanted to start looking at this? So here I've got a, I've got a BI Manager Data Mart, and we've created it. And there is a Management Data Mart tool inside a SQL Server, but we're not going to use that for this. We're really creating our own, and what's really nice about this is you can kind of create this in an afternoon. You just stand up, create the tables, and load the packages in. Uh, as we'll see when we step through some of the packages here, they're very simple packages, and especially when you know, I'm building it here on my local machine. I don't have huge production volumes, so we'll have to keep that in mind a little bit, but we can easily create this very, very quickly. So we've got our, our dates, and then we've got servers, and these are really things that apply to everything, right? So dates and servers and users, users are probably going to already exist in our data warehouse, and these are all the people in our company. Uh, if we expand up this table, we can see here, uh, me and my domain, I, it's me and uh, a service account. There's, there's not a whole lot of people in my domain, uh, so I've got me and my service account, and we're the two users inside of this database. And as we look through here, if we expand in on this SSIS piece, we know we've got executables, execution results, and then we've got two fact tables about executable performance and package performance. And if you look at it, you'll notice that it's structured exactly the same as we would structure any other data mart. So when we start thinking about our event handler, if we look at the table, we can break that out and say, okay, well, I want to create a distinct list of my dimensions, which are just my packages, and I want to create a distinct list of just my executables, which are everything that exists inside of a package. And I want just a distinct list of all the servers that I have. And I can move this and I can manipulate it around into fact tables with dimensions. And then once I've got it in that star schema, I can then put it into whatever I want. I can put it into analysis services, multi-dimensional, I can put it in tabular, I can put it in a reporting services report. However I want to review that data, I can look at it that way. So if I look through here and I just take a look at, uh, we'll just take a look at our executable dimension, for example. We can see in our executable, we've got uh, the name and what's the GUID. So what's the unique identifier of it that SSIS is giving it? We don't really need to do anything with it. We're really just kind of using it as our business key in this case. Uh, so we're just going to keep it in there so we've got it. But if there's more information that we want to track about executables, we can do that as well. So maybe we want to track something like uh, who created it or who created the package if we come into our package dimension. So in our package dimension, we're pulling information from both uh, our event handler piece, which is where we're doing this, and we're doing pulling from the SSIS DB as well. And a question that we might come up with, with at first is, uh, hang on, oh, still want me that question. Uh, so 
are, one of the questions we might ask at first is, why can't we just use the SSI SDB to do this? Because the SSI SDB was created in 2012. In theory, this should be able to answer all these questions already for us, right? But if we expand the SSI SDB and we really start looking into it, it's great, but we have one really big problem that we're missing. And the problem that we've got with it is that this is on a per server level. So if I have if I have 10 SSIS servers, and all 10 of these SSIS servers are running, and they have their own packages that they run, and I have an SSIS DB on each server, they're all independent of each other. So there's no reporting that gets done that covers all 10 of these servers at once. They, each one operates independently. I can view server A's performance metrics, and then I can go back and I can view server B's. But I can't do server A plus B all at once, which is why even though we have the SSI SDB in 2012 and we have the project deployment model, it's still a good idea to use that event handler and to build your own frameworks to be able to track what these packages are doing. Uh, but if I look at this, there is some good information that I can get out of this information in the SSI SDB. So I can say uh, what folders have people created. So if I expand my integration services catalog, we can see that I have two projects. I have an administration folder uh, and I have a Pragmatic Works Insurance folder, which is where our transactional database lives that we're moving into our data warehouse or our data mart. And then underneath our project, we've got all of our packages that detail it out, right? So we've got all this information that lives inside of the SSI SDB. We can pull all this information out, put it into our own data mart. So as we're building these things, we're going to create our our package dimension, and our package dimension contains the package, the project, the folders. And once we look at it this way, it would look the same as any other dimension, right? So we can see this is very hierarchical in nature. So I got my package, I got my project, and I've got the folder that it belongs to. So if I have multiple projects under one folder, I can group it all through this hierarchy. So I can, I have this natural order of how things appear. Sorry. Uh, so, as I'm looking at all this information, what's what's the next step? So this is my SSIS mart. And so I've got, if I look, I've got my fact table. I've got a package level which contains my package key, my server key, my execution result, uh, what user bin it, uh, what day was it run, how long did it run, and how long did it run in minutes. And I can do the same thing for the executable. So I can track both by executable and I can track by package. And as I've got these fact tables together, and then I've got them built, then I've got my dimensions around them, I've got my typical star schema approach. With uh, SSAS, or actually before I get on to SSAS, are there any questions on the SSIS piece? I know I kind of went through it relatively quickly. Um, again, I'm assuming that there's some familiarity within between uh, the SSIS DB and building your own frameworks. Uh, okay, so I see a couple more questions popped in here as I've got it. Uh, can we get this information without using BI Express? Uh, yes, you can. This doesn't, I'm just using BI Express because it's what I have, because it's very easy for me to apply it because I have a license for it. But if you don't and you have your own custom event handler framework that you've built, feel free to use that. As long as you're tracking the key elements of information, you don't necessarily have to have BI Express. It's, it's one of those things of you can build it yourself, and you can use BI Express. Whatever you have, whatever you want to use is what you can use. I'm just using this. Uh, is this available as part of BI Express, or is this proprietary pragmatic works? Uh, Michael, it's neither. This is just something that I've created. In fact, actually, when we get to the end of the presentation, I'm going to tell you guys something where you can just go out there and download it, and you can just pull it in. Uh, please define how you're using the term executable. An executable is inside of SSIS just a piece of the data flow. So if I've got, uh, we'll pull up, oh, let's open up an SSIS package, not an SSIS dimension, that would help. So inside of SSIS, I have like my control flows and I have my data flows. Anything that happens inside of it is, a, is an executable. So this SQL task right here, the SQL component, this is an executable, because when this runs, it does something. It does a, a container of work, so it does a container of something. 
No matter whatever it is, it's going to do something. If I come in here to my data flow, inside of my data flow, I have lots more transformations, right? And these are also all components or executables because this component goes and does something and then this component does something and this conditional split does something too. So all these different pieces inside of my data flow do something different all the way through. Uh, all the data was populated with the event handlers inside SSIS 2012. Uh, yes, yep, so all this data was populated beside, inside of these event handlers. So if, as long as you've got this event handler created, this framework, uh, you can go through and create whatever you need. Right. So if you want to track, maybe there's something that you want to track that nobody else does. So maybe uh, who created the package is something very important to you and your organization. Or, or maybe you've got another property that you want to track as well of uh, the logging mode or what's the isolation level. All these things are things that you can track within that framework that you can put. You can completely custom build it, so whatever you want to see. So as all these executables run, these event handlers are logging what those things are doing into the table. So what's it doing? How's it going through? Um, what's the performance look like? All right. All right, so if we move on to SSAS. So SSAS is a little bit trickier because if we look at a typical SSAS database, uh, we've got, I'm going to open up my multidimensional instance here. I've got my AdventureWorks cube, and our AdventureWorks cube here does, uh, we've got all of our information, right? So it's just typical AdventureWorks. The challenge that we have is if I'm just a, a regular user, and I'm in here using this, and I'm just pulling information in, and then I come to you and I say that it's not performing well, or, uh, you know, how can I make this better? I'm just, I'm not doing it right. Um, how do I go through from that? Hang on just one second. What's the role of max concurrent executables in SSIS performance? Uh, Sanjeev, that's a little bit out of scope uh, for what this one is, uh, but there are a couple of really great blog posts out there on max concurrent executables. Essentially, it controls the number of executables that can run at once. So if I flip back over to that package real quick, sorry not to make everybody lose, but I've got my max concurrent executables. By default, it's set to negative one, which is 90% of the scenarios is perfectly fine. But if I've got a server that's only got two cores, I can say only ever use uh, these two, only ever run two executables at once, and then it won't ever run these if there's concurrency that can happen. So that's just a quick explanation, uh, but there's tons more information out there on what exactly it is. But coming back into analysis services, if I've got my, my, I've got my measures and I've got my people that are using it, so my question, as a business intelligence administrator or developer is who's using my cube, when are they using it, and how often are they using it. And as I'm initially rolling out these data marts and these business intelligence scenarios, this is one of the most important questions that I can ask, right, is, okay, I've done all this work, I've built it, and I've given it to you. Are you using it? Do you like it? How can we adjust this for you? And fortunately, analysis services has a feature that's built in that allows us to track this information. And we access it by right-clicking on the name of our server. So this is, our, this is the name of our analysis services server. So I'm just going to go into the server properties here by right-clicking and going down to properties. And if I click on it and go into properties, and I'm going to click on the general tab. And on the general tab, I'm going to expand this up a little bit so we can see it. There are about halfway down, there's four properties about the log. And they all start with log and then backslash. And I got my query log. And the first one is create query log table, the query log connection string, sampling, and the table name. So what this does is by default it's set to false. So it's always off when you first log in. But I'm going to come in here and I set it to true. And then when I set it to true, it's going to ask me what do I want to connect to. So I'm going to connect to a server and I'm going to give it a database name. Uh, so here's the name of the database where I'm saving it to. And usually you could just use Windows authentication. And then how much of this data do I want to sample? So I'm sampling 100% just because I wanted to get enough data so I could show you guys today. Uh, but typically in an actual production environment, you'd never set that number higher than about 40 because you don't want to put so much. Every time you do that, you're putting a lot of pressure on the server to track that information of exactly what somebody's accessing, and it's going to slow down your queries. So you want to keep that number as small as possible, but as big as possible, so that way you can get a good representative sample of it. 
and then I can give it a, the name of the table. So the name of my table is going to be the multidimensional OLAP query log, and that's just what I'm calling it, because in this case, I've also turned it on from my tabular database, and in the tabular database, I do it the exact same way. So I come in here to properties on the server, go to general, and I'll notice that I have those exact same properties. And so when I do this and I set this value and I click OK, and then I'm going to come back into my BI Manager Data Mart up here, and I can see here's my two tables. So here's my multidimensional and here's my tabular query log. And these are the two things that were created. Uh, higher than what number you said? 40%. Uh, so I would never set that number higher than 40 unless you have a really, really darn good reason that you really, really need to. So uh, typically that number for your sampling, your query log sample, is never going to be very high. 40% uh, is usually the max. But if I do a select on this table, then I'm going to see here's the queries of, of what's happened on my analysis services instance. So I know that on my analysis services instance, on my local machine, I've queried the AdventureWorks Data Warehouse uh, Multidimensional Enterprise Edition cube twice, and I've queried the Pragmatic Insurance cube once. And if I look over here on the right, I can see three things that are really interesting to me. I see who the user is, so what user was it, what time did it start, so what day and time did the query start, so here's my date and here's my time, and how long was it. So how long in seconds were they connected to my queue before they stopped, uh, did, before they disconnect or before the query finished, or, or however, however long they were connected to that queue before they went offline. So these are important metrics. So A, I can say, okay, how many people have accessed my cube over the last week? And B, how long were they accessing it on average when they did? But again, if I look at this, it's very, very dirty. Here's kind of the way that it's logging, right? So I've got my database name, I've got my user, I've got my start time, and I've got my duration. But really the only facts in here that I have of note is my start time and my duration. So those are really the only two things in here that are actual fact metrics that I'd want to report off of. If I want to report this, and I want to report this with, say, SSIS stuff, I can bring it together with my dimensions, because I know who my users are. My users are going to be the same across the enterprise, regardless of whether it's IS, AS, or RS. Whoever's accessing the data, I know that it's going to be this certain list of users, so I can make that its own dimension. And then I can make the OLAP database its own dimension, because that, that way I can reduce some of this redundancy that's happening in this column here, so I can split it out a little bit. So if I look at my, uh, my fact SSAS query duration table, which we've remodified here a little bit, I can see I've got a really short fact table. I've got my user, I've got what the OLAP object is, which is whatever that OLAP database is, what day did they make a query, what time, and how long. So how long were they accessing it when they did access it? And if I come over here into my my SSIS database, or my SSIS packages. Let's open this up real quick. And here's our solution explorer. So I can see I'm just doing some simple dimension and fact table loading. So here's my fact table. I'm just writing a quick query off of it. I'm doing a lookup. I mean, it's everyday data warehouse, data mark, fact table, and dimension table loading. And if I load my dimensions, uh, we'll open up our dimension collab object. So it's just a typical everyday data mart approach, right? So in this case, I'm using a slowly changing dimension wizard because I've got three rows, and there's not really a whole lot of reason why I need to go any bigger than that. Uh, but again, that's something that you've got to watch out for if you're going to use that wizard, is uh, watch out for the scalability on it. After about 10,000 rows, it really starts to degrade significantly. But if you've got less than a couple hundred rows, this will work fine. So we're just loading our dimension up, and then we're just going to load our fact table up. And then with a, our typical data warehouse framework, we have our master package at the end, which rolls everything together and rolls all these pieces. So it does all the loading for us. And then we just put that on a job. So we have our, we have our entire SSIS solution that's really monitoring SSIS. So we have an SSIS project that's 
loading these packages and creating this data mart that's tracking itself, so it becomes full circle in a way. So let's switch back over real quick. And the last bit we'll need to talk about is our reporting services tracking. So in the report server, uh, if and regardless of whether you're running it in native mode or SharePoint mode, you still have this report server database. And this report server database in it has a view. And a word of warning, anytime you're talking about any of these system databases, report server DB or the SSIS DB, so either this one or this one, uh, Microsoft reserves the right to change any of the table structures at any time that they so choose. So do not write the reports off of the, the tables. Try to use the views whenever possible. So if you can go to a view, write it off of the view. And the views in the SSISDB are really easy to monitor through uh, most of them are all in the catalog schema. And in the report server DB, they're all in the DBO schema. But the really big view that exists in report server that we really want to keep an eye out for is the execution log 2. And the execution log 2 view contains everything that we would want to know about our report. So we know what's, what machine, what instance this report is running on, what kind of action was being taken on that report, when it started, when it ended, and how long it took to run the report. And then we've got our status, and then we've got some additional info down here in our XML as well. So we've got all this information that we can pull off of our reports. So we can see just by this one view, or just by this one row, I can see that, okay, on uh, September 24th at 4.22 in the afternoon, Chris ran this uh, package runtime report in our BI reports folder, and he started at this time, and it finished at this time. Oh, and let's go to the render so we can actually see what the numbers are. And it took 1,500 seconds to retrieve it, it took 800 seconds to process it, and it took 850 millisecond, or seconds to uh, render it. So all this information lives inside of our report server DB. And again, we don't want to mess with this inside of here because we want to get it out as quick as possible. So it's the same thing as, it's the same approach we would take as if we wanted to get data out of a transactional equipment. Does the SSRS reporting handle subscription? Yes, it does, Keith. Uh, you just need to do a quick uh, modification. So if you look in here, there's actually a, uh, there is a subscriptions table. I'm not sure if it's in the views. But if you look, you've got a subscriptions. And I don't have any subscriptions on mine, but you could use this, this table and track your subscriptions that are being created. And you could do that exact same thing. So as these reports are being run, they're being logged to this execution log too. And if you've got a subscription, you're going to have a, probably a designated service account that's running it, right? So you could be querying for that designated service account and the username. So you could certainly build something like that in, where you'd have your uh, subscription in and running with the rest of your reports, and then you can toggle and say, okay, these subscriptions are running at this time, and so on and so forth. So the key part to this is it's, it's almost impossible to build a one-size-fits-all solution, right? So I built this data mart of this is what works, and I encourage you to, I'm going to make it freely available when we're done here, so anybody can go out there and download it, but I encourage you to modify it and adjust it for your own local environment, because however you build your event handlers is going to change from shop to shop, and how you use reporting services is not going to change that much, but there's still some syncrasies or some little bits between, uh, between shop to shop. And are we able to generate the BR data mart for a lower version of SQL Server 2005, 2008, or 2? Uh, yes, you, you can. Uh, right now, I only built this in 2012 to start, uh, but I'll get to that a little bit later at the end here. Uh, there's actually, I'm going to work on building a 2008 version of this as well that I'll put up there that you can download that, that way you can just pull through. But there's nothing that stops you from doing this. In fact, the first version of this that I built was in 2008. It was just a long time ago and I don't have the solution file for it anymore. But you can do this in any version as long as you've got the ability to track this information, which we've always had. Right. We've always had the execution log in reporting services. We've always had, uh, we haven't always had the SSIS DB, but we've always had the ability to put event handlers in our SSIS packages and create that framework. So we've always been able to do these things. So if I look at my SSRS stuff, uh, my SSRS is going to look just a little bit different. Uh, let's, let's do a filter on this real quick so we can see just the SSRS piece. 
So our SSRS piece, we have our fact table of our SSRS report performance. And in it, we've got our report, which is the name of our report. And then we've got our report request. And we've got a report status dimension. And of these three dimensions, um, they all just tie to the fact table. And we can see we've got our users information in here as well. What time, what day did they start it? What day did they end it? And what time did they start it? So we can get that time. And then here's my facts down here at the end of my data retrieval, my rendering, and my processing, and how many rows did I have. Uh, the request type column my execution log two view now shows interactive value, but it'll show subscription. Yep, yeah, that's exactly right. So you could just use that as a toggle too. So again, there's this is a kind of a, a loose framework. However you need to modify it to fit your environment, I encourage you to do so. I, the, the idea behind it is how easy it is for us to manage all this data, not necessarily exactly how we have it structured here. So what's nice is once we've got all this information created, so we've got all this information created, we've got it collected, I've got my fact tables, I've got my dimensions, and now I get into my, my actual development, right? So I can create a, in this case I created a tabular database, uh, but I could also create a multidimensional database just as easily, or I could create, uh, maybe I don't want to go with a multidimensional database at all. Once I'm at this point, now I'm really at a data mark approach, right? So now I've got my data mark created, it exists, it lives, how, whatever my company standard is for accessing this information is whatever I want to use. So I could use a multidimensional instance, or I could use a tabular instance, or I could just use reporting services, however I want to access this information. I use the tabular database uh, just as an example, but again, you can change it however you would need to. And so I've got all these different pieces, and we can see that I brought it all in. And if I switch over to diagram view here, as I switch to diagram view, here's all the different fact tables I've got throughout. So I've got my SSIS pieces here, and then I've got my reporting services piece over here, and then down here at the bottom right, I have my query duration, which is my SSIS. So inside of this, this tabular database, I have all these different pieces that tie together, and we can see as I go through, I'm doing some calculated columns just to pull out whatever the hour is of the query time. So that way we can see this is what hour this happens on, which would be handy for reports. So we know by hour, this is what happens. Or um, we could do the same thing for report. How does tabular database differ from a relational database? So that's a, that's a really deep question uh, that'll get us really far off topic, uh, but relational databases are all transactional in nature. Tabular databases are multidimensional, or, or they're not multidimensional, sorry, but they're, uh, they're an analysis services database that we can use to compress our data and do our analysis off of it. So relational is going to be all about transactions. Uh, but as I'm going back to these things, I can go into my report performance, and then we can see I can create all these different metrics. So if I take reporting services, for example, this is that fact table I created off my reporting services data. So I've got my reports, my server, my status, what day it was. Here's my data retrieval. Uh, here's that time processing, and here's how many rows that I had. And down here at the bottom, I'm just creating some measures just to tell me what are the different pieces. So how many runs have I had? How many reports have ever been run? Uh, how many distinct reports are out there in my environment that exist off of this table. And if I have uh, multiple reporting services instances, so maybe I don't have just one. So in my case, I only have one reporting services instance, but maybe I have 15 reporting services instances. I can take all those data, all that data from all those different reporting services instances, the same as I can the SSI SDB, and centralize them all together into this BI Manager data mark that I've got. And this data mart has got a, a completely kind of independent operation of itself so that we can write all this data to it and then we can do all of our reporting on it. Uh, what's the average time to report? So how long does it take to get the retrieval? And what's the longest that any report has taken to render out of everything that I've got? And what's the longest that any report's taken to process? And you kind of get the idea. We've got all these different measures and they tell us all these different things, right? So when I've got that, so I go through here, I've got all my different pieces, I've got my, my measures, I've got my information. If I come over here in the package, we can see that I'm doing a couple more uh, 
measures off of my SSIS packages as well. Um, how long has it taken for all this information to run? And then I really have my, my options. So option one is I could create uh, some reporting services reports that live off of it. So if I come in here, I could just create a quick package. I could just create a one report called package runtime so I can see. And if I click on it, it's going to render here my local environment. In theory, there we go. And I can see here's the, here's how long each package ran. When it failed, it took this long. When it ran successfully, it took this long. So I can get all these metrics about my data very, very quickly. I can deploy this out there to a main reporting services environment where I can then give the ad information available to maybe my SSIS developers. Maybe I have a set of reports about SSIS performance that I give to my SSIS developers. And maybe I have a set of reports about SSIS that I give to my SSIS developers. And the same thing for SSRS. Or maybe I just have one centralized repository where everybody on the BI team can pull in all these BI management reports. So if this is how my data is going. Or maybe we don't want to use reporting services at all. So we went through all that work and we created that data mart. We created our our tabular database, and then we're just going to create some reporting services reports on top of it. If we want to, we can go that way, but maybe we don't want to do that. So maybe we want to give uh, a dashboard to our, our manager of our department or our CIO or whoever so we can show them, like, you gave us an SLA of 15 seconds to render a report, or you gave us an SLA of 20 minutes to finish the whole nightly process. So the great thing is once we get to that point, now we're just using Excel. So we can just pull up Excel and we can do some connecting to it. So I'm going to create a new tab here uh, just real quick so we can kind of see what it's doing. Whoop. Enter not backspace. And we can connect to our, uh, we'll connect to our SSIS perspective that we've created here. And as we do it, then we can create uh, views off of what we want to see. So here's how long each executable takes to complete in seconds. And here's the name of that executable. So how long does this one take? And this is where the importance of naming standards comes into our SSIS package. So I can see here's all my, here's all my SQL statements right here. So I know that if I have a truncate table statement, they should all start with SQL and they should all start with truncate because that's what they're doing. That's the name of whatever it's doing. So as I'm running through here, I can see, okay, all these take 0, 0.0 seconds to complete, and you know, then I have one that takes five minutes to complete. So what's going on with that one? So it allows me to drill into it very, very quickly to see what's happening with my performance. And once you kind of work around with this a little bit, take a look, and then you wind up with a nice dashboard on top of it that shows us here's our Here's our average duration in seconds for how long it takes to complete. And here's each individual package. Here's our master package for kind of what we would expect. And here's the grand total for how long everything takes. And we can see here's our chart down here at the bottom. We've got a nice date measure up here at the top. And we've got the same thing where we can toggle by server. So if I've got multiple servers, I can see, okay, this server A took this long. Server B takes this long. Uh, how long do all these pieces go? And then as I've looked through my data flow executables here, I can see these are my, my 10 worst data flow executables. So I can just have a view that shows me this information very quickly. So I've got my dashboard on a daily basis. And then what's really nice about this is the only thing I need to do when I come in every day is open up this report. I don't need to monitor the database. I don't need to do the tag. It's the same thing as anything, right? So now I don't have to go through and do all that on a daily basis. All I have to do is view my dashboard and every morning when I come in and I'm set and ready to go. I have the same thing. I have a tab for SSAS. Uh, how to turn on logging for tabular models. Uh, it's not recording any usage. Uh, Prashant, it's a, it's a little setting that you have to tweak in there. Uh, if you come in here, and go to properties on the tabular database and go to general when you're in the log. Uh, you can try to change this to SA and then give the password and then it should go through and log it. Uh, sometimes I've noticed even if you set it to 100%, it won't log it all right away. Sometimes the service actually needs to be completely restarted. 
but then I've got my SSAS dashboard, and I've also got my SSRS dashboard. So I can see all my different report times and all my different request types uh, just as I'm coming through here. So I have three tabs. My three tabs show my dashboards. It shows SSI, SSRS, and SSAS. And then as a BI developer, or as a manager, the only thing I'm doing here is I'm just monitoring this, the same as I would monitor, monitor any other process. So if I think about it from a business user's perspective of where I'm using these cubes to manage my process, I'm doing the same thing here. I'm just managing my process. So these are my packages that are running. These are my SSAS servers that are being run. These are my reporting services reports that are being run. So I think we have another question. Uh, can you set up the automatic refresh of the Excel report so that when you open it every morning, it automatically shows updated data? Yes, you can, uh, Usman. So you come up here into our, our our data connections, and under data on connections in Excel, we're going to open that up, and then we're going to go to properties, and there is a little checkbox right here called refresh data when opening the file, and if we check it, and then we click OK. Every time we open up the worksheet, it'll refresh that connection for us. That way we don't have to. We don't have to come in here and manually update it every day. So I know it was quick, and I know it was hard hitting. Uh, I kind of wanted to go a little bit quicker so that we could work through it and so we could see the dashboard. Uh, but are there any questions out there that I missed? Uh, Rachel, did you see any come through? No, Chris, you were actually catching them as they came in. I was trying to keep an eye on it. Yep, you did great. Let's see. Um, this one says, can we pull the metrics from DTS packages? Uh, yeah, you can. As long as you're logging them off to a database somewhere, you can pull it. So if you can get if you can get to that log file, uh, so one thing that you could do with this, that if you wanted to, is you could even pull in server logs. So as the servers are doing, you could really kind of extend this concept to server performance. DT, if DTS is logging and you've got it logging off to a location in a file, you can pull those files and you can pull all that information into this, this Mart. And Michael says, where can he download the Data Mart and project files? Will you um, put uh, those out on your blog? Uh, yeah, it's going to be on my blog, and I'll also have a CodePlex site up for it. Uh, probably, I don't know if it'll be today, but it'll definitely be by the end of this week. Uh, I'll try to have it up on my blog this afternoon, though. So all this information will be freely available for download, uh, where you guys can just go out there and download it and then pull it. And again, though, you'll have to adjust to fit your local environment. It's a, it's in no way a kind of a one size fits all. It's more of a template, so you just have to go in and adjust it for whatever your local environment would be. But it'll all be available for download off of my blog and off of CodePlex by the end of the week. Okay, and this question says the dashboard in Excel is done using Power Pivot, and that was a question. Uh, no, the dashboard in Excel is just done using native SSIS or native Excel tools. Uh, so if I come in here and uh, where was that sheet that we created? So here's my sheet with just my pivot table of what I created. The only thing I did is I came through here and let's filter this down a little bit so we can take a look. So let me say, let me just say top 10. So here's my top 10 executables that took. And uh, I want to change the format a little bit, so we'll clean that up. And uh, how about that one? That's fine. And then we'll insert a slicer. So we're going to go to the insert tab and insert a slicer. We'll insert our server name. And then I just turned off grid lines. So you can kind of see where I'm going. So I just adjusted it. These are all just native built-in Excel functionality that you can use. You don't necessarily have to have Power Pivot to do it. You could just create a Power Pivot model instead of a tabular database or a multidimensional database if you really wanted to put it in Power Pivot. It's entirely up to you. Okay, and this question says, what is the dashboard created on? Is it Excel or any other Excel plugin? Uh, the dashboard's just straight up Excel. It's Excel 2013, uh, but you could do all these features in 2010 as well. Okay, and this one says, you said that SSRS part works even if you're running in SharePoint mode. Is it, it still uses the report server database? 
Right, yes. So whenever reporting services is installed in SharePoint integrated mode, there's still a report server DB. It's still tied to report server. I think it might be an sh actual SharePoint content database, though. I'd have to double check my notes. Uh, but it still gets logged to the report server database, and you can still pull it exactly the same. Okay. And Mark says, how do you get the SSIS database installed? Is that something that you'll list in your blog, Chris? Uh, this SSIS DB? Yeah. Yeah, I can, uh, what I'll do is I'll put a link to it in my blog. It's actually set up as you're installing SQL Server 2012, and then you would create an integration services catalog, so I'll provide a link to it. Perfect. Thanks. And just as a reminder, everyone, our sessions are recorded and will be made available by the end of the week. So if you want to go back and review or you want to share with a colleague or a friend, um, please do so. If you go to pragmaticworks.com, go to our learning center, um, go to free training, and you can find past webinars and any of our future sessions that are coming up. And do we have any more questions out there that, that we haven't covered? I'm going to pull up my PowerPoint presentation real quick here, and I'm going to pull up my last slide. And uh, So any comments that anybody has, I'm more than welcome to hear. I always like to get feedback just on how my presentation went, uh, just kind of things I could do better, things I could do differently, uh, things that worked, or maybe you think about a different question later on. Uh, please feel free to email me. You can reach me on either of those emails, or you can also reach me on Twitter. Uh, feel free to reach out. Perfect. We'll give you just a couple more seconds to uh, review that slide and, and copy that information if you need to. And uh, looks like one more question says, is there any feature um, that can track for many rows inserted, updated in BI environment? That can track for many rows that are inserted into a BI environment? Mm -hmm. uh, there aren't any tools, but what you could do is you could track it through an event handler. So as a part of this event handler, if we look, uh, I'm going to move off of this real quick. And if we come into our facts, oh, let's unfilter it. That's why I can't find it. I don't remember if I actually put it in here. Uh, I didn't. Nope. But we've actually got that ability to track it. So if I come down here a little bit, There we go, total records extracted. So we can put this in a, a row count variable, or you can get creative with your SSIS package and have it track how many rows it's moving from place to place and track it to a table. And as it's tracking it to a table, then you can go through and adjust it and have it right off to wherever you want. And then you could track how many rows are being moved as well. Okay, and Kate says, could you please put up your blog information again? Ah, uh, sure. Oh, and it's not even on the little end slide. I'm sorry about that. That's okay. I'm going to have to fix that. Uh, so my blog site is just uh, intelligentsql.wordpress.com.